everybody. I'm sorry, we are having a little bit of technical difficulty. So we're um, just introducing ourselves and starting with Anat. Can you okay. introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Anat Mattel. I'm the chairperson of the De Department of Marital Family Therapy, uh, Art Therapy, originally called Clinical Art Therapy. It was found, founded by Helen V. Langarten uh, about 35 years ago. And uh, we're, you, you can hear, oh, I'll speak louder. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you can't hear. No, Try we again. We changed. We're the checking. Sound. We're yeah. checking the the volume. <laughs> so, I was just saying that I'm really, really excited to have Nancy, uh, Nancy Cho, who hopefully will speak more about this endeavor, bring this to us, um, and many of our students who are very interested in media and technology. I think we at LMU and generally in the field are trying to catch up, frankly, um, often because. Um, us older folks sometimes have not had the ample exposure to media that I think now is very uh, readily available for everybody. And so I think it's wonderful. There are many, many opportunities and I'm excited to learn about them and also to admit that I'm certainly not an expert and there may be better experts here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is, I just wanted to make the, um, make sure that we're not here as experts, but we are really definitely interested in everybody's experience and teaching and learning mm -hmm. at the same time. And um, just so you know, these are students who have some digital media experiences in their own creative process. Mm -hmm. So if you could just briefly talk each, talk about how your background in digital media, that'd be great. Sure. My name is Anya Kavanaugh. Uh, I am a first year in the marital and family therapy program. I, in undergrad, I studied painting and art history, and my thesis was about um, virtuality and tangibility, artificial and natural, and how it's a binary that shouldn't exist, and how we're in the age of spectrums, and it's kind of the same concept, how digital, the digital world is a spectrum in the same way that um, some diagnoses are. Beautiful. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Pauline Gola, and I'm a part-time student here, and um, I come to art therapy from fine art photography, uh, doing a lot of work in Photoshop, and that's my primary uh, media, and I also um, studied music at USC and was a DJ for a long time, and I did a lot of work digitally that way, using Ableton and Serato and some of the software that's been mentioned here. Great. Um, my name is Nick Rademacher. I am, um, I mainly work in video as my medium. I have an MFA from Alfred University in Electronic Integrated Arts, which was just really the whole spectrum of working through the computer. And I mainly make um, experimental documentaries. Oh, great. Awesome. So I'm going to throw this <coughs> question out to the students, so any one of you can answer this. But ha since you guys have an experience um, using digital technology, coming into this program in art therapy, has that kind of changed or defined differently the way you see art or art therapy? I've been trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the um, work that we're doing here is really tactile um, in this semester, so it's my second semester, um, we've been given the chance to give full-on responsive in, in artwork and not, not kind of like smaller doodles or things like that. And I've been starting to integrate the video through yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And working with, instead of a documentaries where I work with my own footage, I've actually been looking for um, public domain footage mm -hmm. and um, augmenting that and creating short videos. Yeah, and I think the program does a good job to try and incorporate uh, using digital media in the projects. Um, I think sometimes there maybe isn't as much exposure as I would like um, through, because digital art encompasses so much. It's such right. a broad topic. Yes. Um, and saying like do a digital piece of art is, you could take a photo of something, you could, um, it's just, it's so vague and so broad, mm -hmm. whereas there's animation and green screen and um, digital painting, you could do machine art, you know, it's, it's, so I feel like sometimes we don't know what the opportunities are unless somebody tells us. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like maybe um, that's something that I, I wish I saw more was um, more of the exposure of 
what the world encompasses of digital media. Mm -hmm. So because each thing has its own method of expression and works for different types of brains, you know, and I think that's important too for clients in art therapy um, to have that that broad understanding. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely there. You know, even with the apps, there are mm -hmm. things that are more where it's you have to use your more cognitive brain, whereas the other ones are more maybe sensory based um, or just perceptual. So things are that there are definitely different qualities to each one and. I think um, just art therapy field in general, not just you know schools, could do maybe a better job in categorizing or giving the tools for students to learn more about it. You know? Yeah, and I think it's really important, like where we are today in, in the history of technology and the the devices that we have at our fingertips and that most people have and our clients have, and how can we integrate that? And especially when we think about working with children or adolescents, mm -hmm. um, because that's their that's their world, you know, and they're they're not they're growing up being able to like scan through their their parents' phones, mm -hmm. and so how do you talk to them and, and and how are you relatable to them? Right. Yeah. Do you feel like um, as students coming in, um, do you think that digital literacy, in terms of just not as a creative expression, but just knowing digital literacy, having that kind of awareness, what the media or the technology can do, it, would that be just a very important component of kind of your learning experience? And do you feel like you're well equipped to handle that? Well, for me, I came knowing about digital media and in order to get into the program, I had to learn how to work in an analog way. Mm. So I went through this whole process of, of um, Kind of being freed from um, having an expectation of what my work should look like um, because when I was working digitally I um, had this idea of wanting to get into galleries and get into shows and working digitally uh, working with analog media allowed me to not, like let go of those expectations mm -hmm. so I think that um, it can work the opposite way, whereas if we let somebody work digitally and they're used to working with analog media, it can set them free and vice versa. Great, yeah. Well, that's exactly what Anthony had said earlier. He talked about how he sometimes expected students to come in, this younger generation, well, so equipped with wanting to do digital work, but oftentimes they want to go back and do very hands-on um, craft-like work, so that's very interesting where you feel like you're actually free, mm -hmm. you know, from that expectation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes the pressure off. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, Anat, what do you feel like um, in terms of the school, like what are, as you're structuring classes or the program, um, is there any kind of consideration for digital sure. technology and media? Sure, yes. Yeah. So there's plenty. I, I took notes because in some ways I'm really a representative of our bigger faculty. You've Everybody who's listened heard before <coughs> a little bit with Kathleen, who does have a component uh, about social media. And specifically in the ethics course, which I teach, but she comes in and gives a particular presentation about considerations mm -hmm. that are very important for all the reasons you just named, right? So there's accessibility, um, but there are also ethical considerations right. and legal uh, considerations that we have to take into account, particularly around privacy and confidentiality and um, triggers and all, 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 a, a few other pieces that we have to always take into account. Um, all the way from how we present ourselves as clinicians and our Facebook pages and our Instagrams and what that looks like, all the way to what we do with clients' artwork and how do we uh, post or name something about our sessions, which there's um, still not enough guidelines, right, in, in general of what's okay and not okay. And, and in this particular day and age, we can certainly see a lot of things posted on YouTube that are really on the, the margins of what is okay or not okay as far as uh, client confidentiality is concerned. So I, I think we're still, as a field, and in this program as well, but I think it's really uh, an illustration of where the field is, treading, treading through, trying to figure out, okay, well, what what is it that we need? What is it that our students want? Also, what is it that our alums want? So as I'm hearing this, I think this is all wonderful and very, for me, inspirational and very clarifying 
Um, we've known for a long time that our alums specifically, and our students clearly, and actually all of us, could use more training, more specific trainings. And there's been um, some interest, and every year we have certainly more and more students who are either doing some of their projects as social media or about social media. Um, you yourself uh, created your final project about that, and there are some publications that came out of those. So there's, there's a growing interest and there's a growing um, field of study in there, but still there's not competency. As a general guideline, I think we still, the majority of our practices are centered on still face-to-face -face, um, interactions with some modifications per need. So, for example, most of our supervision is still face-to-face, -face, analog, art, right? But we, we are trying to infuse a possibility of using media with clients, and if there, are, if there is a need to have supervision augmented through a remote, we could use that sometimes. Our applications, for those of you who came into the program in the last few years, are almost all online until you get invited for a group interview. Um, the final research is all posted uh, digitally and is accessible for the world. We have uh, peer-reviewed, one of the only open access peer-reviewed mm -hmm. art therapy journals that comes from this department and is accessible worldwide. We have readership from thousands of readers around the world. Um, that's the Journal of Clinical Art Therapy, if anybody is interested in looking at it. Um, so, you know, and we are certainly trying to uh, input more. So. Professor Lavinia Jackson, for example, does do digital story as in one of her courses. I'm not sure. I think it's the adolescent. Yeah. So you may mm -hmm. right uh -huh. now, right now, you may be in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're living it. Uh, you can share more about that. Um, I think each of us in the faculty are trying to figure out where and how to place that into our courses. Mm -hmm. But certainly, there is room for growth. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, I felt um, coming in as mainly a video artist. I felt really accepted during my first semester, yeah. and I talked with all of my professors for the art component. I'm like, would it be okay if I turned in a video? And, yeah. and they were all like, absolutely, of yeah. course. And I didn't always do that, mm -hmm. but the fact that they were open and accepting of it was really, it felt really um, yeah. affirming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we learn a lot by seeing what you do, because mm -hmm. it opens up to right. see mm -hmm. and what Anya's done and yeah. um, the different types of projects people have brought to class that are using the different apps. And like Anya said, there's so many different ways to do it. Yeah. Um, so we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think like the materials and methods in terms of the digital, because I think um, the digital technology is great for making things seamless and more efficient, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if the digital media is just there to simulate conventional materials, I don't think that's such a useful tool. I think it needs to be used for what it is, and, and oftentimes, and oftentimes, the the apps or software programs that are out there are not specifically made for art therapy. It's not mm -hmm. made for therapeutic services or self-expressions in a different way. It's usually usually either commercial or more based on the mainstream. What are some of the things that you notice if you were going to apply some of the techniques or materials and methods that you use digitally? If you were going to apply that with clients. What's lacking? What are some of the challenges? Besides confidentiality, which is a big thing. One component that really struck me when I was thinking about this is that when you're working digitally, you have the option to undo, which mm -hmm. completely is a different way of working. Right. I, I came in being used to that, so no matter what I did in Photoshop, I could undo it. Mm -hmm. But once I started working, um, with traditional materials, it's much harder to undo, and I, I had this anxiety about it. So I think that there is a way to um, capitalize on that when working with clients who may right. be scared Definitely. or mm -hmm. as just as part to offer mm -hmm. that to mm -hmm. people. Yeah, I think, like you're saying, it's an incredible opportunity for a restorative experience. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly therapeutic. Um, I believe that kind of what you're saying, how digital media can imitate or be this replacement of tangible media. Um, that's true, but it's completely different in, like my digital art generally takes place on my iPad with my pencil mm -hmm. um, in Procreate, just doing drawings and paintings. And inherently it's contained, whereas if you're painting and you're expressing emotion and the paint goes everywhere, mm -hmm. your emotion's everywhere, mm -hmm. you know? 
but the iPad itself keeps it all kind of wrapped up. Um, and even though it is this imitation of, I think it's therapeutic in its own separate kind of way. Um, I think thinking about digital media um, in terms of replacing other media is um, kind of detrimental to digital media. Mm -hmm. It's gonna it's gonna bring it ten steps backward. Um, where I don't think it's replacing anything ever. I think it's just in addition to. Mm -hmm. You know, we have watercolor, ink, clay, digital. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not one or the other. It's and right. and all. Yeah. I don't think there is a. I think yeah. Anthony said it also. Like, wait, I don't believe there is a digital divide. Mm -hmm. It's just one of many. Um, and I think you guys bring up a good point about there are different features to different applications that we can thoughtfully think about them and use them therapeutically depending on the client and customize it, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a nice feature of digital work that we could kind of actually think about, oh, like this client might need this, this would work therapeutically with this client and kind of cater to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, one, of the, one of the things that I was reminded as we were talking about is that I actually, not certainly being an expert, typically learned about social media from my clients. And one of, the, one of the things that are very exciting about it is that this is one of those places where they can be experts because I clearly mm -hmm. am not knowledgeable and they would bring an app that they like or a thing that they're using. And um, in that way, it's also a nice reversal of roles, right, and the sense of competency, right? Um, and I think this is a really beautiful experience uh, for me to think about, okay, how would you use that with therapeutic goals, right? So container, right, in some ways, but then also if somebody's very used to that and the real in the real world they cannot undo something, yeah. how maybe you reverse that intentionally as an intervention, right? So there are many ways, once we understand the properties, mm -hmm. which not all of us have, are as knowledgeable and certainly there's so much to learn but I think once we get a real hold of the properties of different tools or different apps we could really use them to match them with clinical goals much yeah. better yes. yeah and yeah. I think that yeah. um, not all digital media um, thinking of some of the projects Anya's done but I think a lot of digital media kind of lends itself to more than one session mm -hmm. and I think Jeffrey mm -hmm. um, talks about that with a lot of with his apps and things like that and so I think that that's something that working with therapeutic goals and you can kind of figure out what types of digital projects would be a longer term and that they could build on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And having time-based media adds a whole other component of, right. of exploration that um, could do many things, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. right. The other thing I've used before with even simple programs, right? So when you're doing a review of the artwork of clients, if you're creating a PowerPoint, which is the simplest thing all of us should be able to do that, right? Um, and show that to your client. There's something very special about having you make this special thing for them that really goes through the review of the artwork mm -hmm. rather than taking it physically, which also creates something that they can take with them, right? So there, there are many things that you could do that are very simple even. Yeah, yeah. and saving versions too mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. even just one piece of art. Mm -hmm. Just having the version saved mm -hmm. over time um, can show a progression with a client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. What are some of the misconceptions that you feel as um, artists that use digital technology that you've kind of gotten in the art therapy world, maybe, um, or even as students? Well, I think working with Photoshop, there is this preconceived notion that it's cheating, like I'm doctoring photographs. Okay. But um, also, I think I remember hearing that there was an idea within the art therapy field that working digitally doesn't have the same um, kinesthetic sensory components, that it's potentially maybe not as healing mm -hmm. as working digitally. And after working digitally for years, I really disagreed with that because I was working with a tablet and I would definitely enter um, a flow state where I would you know, lose track of time and it, it was, um, just very healing for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe in it just due to my own experience. Yeah, and I think yeah. a lot of... I, I think the question through the chat relates to what you just said, mm -hmm. so I just wanna jump in and um, see if that has a question. Uh, do you think that the digital media limits your expression when you say, for example, that traditional um, art, you know, you gave that example of the paint goes everywhere, mm -hmm. and she, she wants to know your opinion on 
does that limit emotions when it's not going everywhere? Mm -hmm. That was her question. I mean, potentially, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's what we need, you know? Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. I think also you can do something digitally, you can print it out and then make a mess and then put it back digitally, edit some more, you know, it's you can transition between digital and tangible mm -hmm. really easily. And so just depending on what you feel like would help you best, I think you can express or contain your emotions to any degree. Yeah, and I think with, with video it can be really cathartic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there can, especially now that that it's on your phone, so it's not just like you speaking to the video, but you can really just like move it around and it can really be really powerful, um, especially dealing with something like identity or um, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So yeah, I mean, just, it depends on what, like Anya said, it depends mm -hmm. on what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and working with photography, there's um, a photorealism element to it where um, it's extremely expressive because it looks real. So if a photograph has been altered, it's creating another world and mm -hmm. it looks real. And I found that to be extremely expressive. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not splashing paint everywhere, but it's a different type of expression because it's an object that looks real, but it's something that I made up. Yeah, and I think that's important. It's a different type of expression. Mm -hmm. Like, it's still expression, it just looks different. Yeah. yeah, and I think back to what you were asking about the limitations or misconceptions. I think for me as a video artist, people think of video, they think of um, interviews and things like, like mm -hmm. lights and all that type of, you know, this, like when you make a film. But really, you know, video can be something that's a bit more tactile. Video can be something that's a bit more personal. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's something that we really haven't, or at least I don't know of in the art therapy world that we've really ventured into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think those are really important points. I think we're here, we're not advocating to use digital media, but <laughs> we're more about it's, okay. it's an opportunity. And I think art therapists need to have that digital knowledge and awareness and skills mm -hmm. because it is part of our world. People are increasingly yeah. using uh, more and more digital media and if we're not equipped and just have a bias um, about certain materials and methods, whether it's digital media or markers. For the longest time I had, I couldn't stand <laughs> markers <laughs> because of the sound and I, yeah. that was something I had to really overcome myself. Yeah. But it's something that we, unless we know the properties, we can't use them effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, I think, sorry, I think with digital media too, some people don't um, embrace it because of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, fear that it's gonna replace, fear that they're not gonna understand, mm -hmm. fear that it's too much. Um, but I think you just you just gotta move past that and just, yeah, embrace it. Get over it. So, yeah. so hopefully you're, you're all helping us do that. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I, th I think there is. I think there is some, I can speak for myself, but I don't think I'm unique in that. Uh, I think some of it is just a level of competency and I think there are generational differences. And I personally didn't grow up in the US, so my exposure and just access to social media was very different than what we currently have here. Um, but generally, generationally, that's that's all over the world uh, different than how I grew up. Uh, but I, I also think that there are some real limitations and some challenges that we need to take into account. And I don't think they're only in our therapy. I think therapy always deals with some of the challenges that we have in life right now. And I think for kids nowadays, for example, for adults too, but for kids specifically, um, sometimes there is a challenge of di differentiating between real life and videos and what's happening, especially if they're immersed for hours with um, the virtual reality and, and kind of making that switch. And so I think that also becomes an intervention, making a, a determination of how to move from one place to the next and understand the difference between the world that allows for undo and the world that doesn't and the world that has ramifications and also social media exposure when you post something on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, there are responses that are coming in for kids and kids are certainly responding to many people that they cannot control or they cannot you know, necessarily expect mm -hmm. what the responses would be or even the fantasy of that, what the responses would be takes a whole lot of their time. And so these are all conversations that I certainly think we need to take into account. Mm -hmm. the, the kind of, um, casualness that goes for a lot of people with social media is wonderful and sometimes tricky and so again in therapy some of what we 
I think, need to do from a place of competency, but is to determine when and how we respond to clients' texts, right? When, how do we respond to crisis when access is available and everybody expects that you can get back to them within a second because you could get an email or a text or a phone call anywhere, right? And how to regulate themselves if that's not happening even though they're used to having access and you know quickness of responsiveness from friends or parents or whatnot, right? So there are all kinds of things that we're trying to figure out regardless in therapy that also are relevant to art therapy and I think art therapy could also use those against one, one, once we gain more competency and have more guidelines and have more clarity in ways that could really help our clients. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I think it is part of culture, so just mm -hmm. as we have cultural humility and mm -hmm. work on our multicultural mm -hmm. sensitivity, it's, it's knowing our clients, like you mm -hmm. said. Um, one of the things that um, we as art therapists might do is really being curious about our clients' um, culture mm -hmm. using digital media. What is their digital culture mm -hmm. like? And especially m my private practice, I work with a lot of adolescents and young adults. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I always ask them is about their digital culture. And mm -hmm. I do a little, um, when my daughter goes to her pediatrician, she gets a media questionnaire and it asks how mm -hmm. um, many hours do you watch TV? And and it's mm -hmm. not updated. And the, I think it's from the American, um, Pediatric Association or something, and I've kind of used that as a template and created my own questionnaire for um, clients about their media consumptions and what their culture is like, uh, what kind of apps do you use, and how many hours are you on uh, your phone, and things like that. And I, and when I add, give that questionnaire to the parents, and also once I have a therapeutic relationship with the clients, I ask them those questions and I get a huge discrepancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and which is another therapeutic information we yeah. could get. So those kind of things, um, I just want to plug in uh, my article with Natalie Carlton, that's um, at the Art Therapy Journal, and we talk about digital literacy and how that is important for our therapists to have. But I'm also curious, as students, what are some of the skills or knowledge or any kind of classes that you kind of wish are there not just LMU but in art therapy programs or as a whole what would you like to see what kind of what do you think is lacking in terms of technology use or understanding media culture well, I think like specific articles about specific uses in art therapy like I did a side project when we got to pick our topic and I picked digital art and I thought that was really informative because I had no idea you know that um, green screens really benefited this one yeah. client with ADHD mm -hmm. for these specific reasons mm -hmm. you know just that right. tangible um, research and examples was really beneficial for me personally mm -hmm. and I wish that you know that we could all share in those specific yeah. dimensions I would also like to do a, a green screen <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I remember um, hearing about that the art therapy conference and I thought wow that's amazing to use a green screen mm. but I mean I feel like we we get to um, explore things that we want to explore in our assignments we're giving freedom mm -hmm. to um, pursue whatever we're interested in and use the media that we want to use and um, that's been really helpful for me. I feel like really understanding the underlying theories of how to be an art therapist allows us to adapt to whatever media is going to come out and be curious and, mm -hmm. um, for example, have cultural humility when we're approaching these new media and with our populations um, to not go into it thinking that we know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Anything. Or, <laughs> assu or assuming that I, assuming, our, our, right. our younger clients might be the experts because right. uh, digital media, it's also a social justice issues in many cases where we can't assume that everybody has the same access mm -hmm. and right. same so um, way of using the technology. Mm -hmm. So it's also sometimes we kind of sometimes assume that, oh, this person is younger and probably me more savvy, but that's, that's oh, often not, not true at all. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And I want to put a plug for Colleen's been working as a research assistant and has mm -hmm. been studying 
diligently in vivo. Do you want to yeah. say something oh. about that? Yeah, well, I, I can't imagine doing qualitative research without software. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to picture how, do you, how would that happen, and I've talked to Deborah Linich about how <laughs> she did it, and with highlighting interviews in different colors and cutting out um, themes and put, making piles, and so I've been using in vivo to do all of that digitally, and even just in doing my work for the program here, doing a literature review, um, it was really overwhelming just trying to keep track of all the themes that I wanted to keep mm-hmm. track of when I was reviewing the literature and um, then learning through my uh, research work that in vivo can be used to do that and over a period of time and have it all stored in one place and I can build on it um, and it's wonderful for finding um, places of intersectionality within uh, qualitative research so taking it to a new level um, I am so excited about it. Um, I can't imagine doing it any other way. <laughs> Is it like a type of database? or? It's qualitative research software that allows you to um, do thematic analysis and um, yeah, you can run queries on on the, uh, the text that you're analyzing and, and it's almost um, allows you to look at qualitative data in a quantitative way so you can count right. how many times mm-hmm. people said a certain yeah. thing along a certain line and then you can dive deeper into exactly what they said and that's awesome so more yeah. more, more descriptive statistics right, right? Mm-hmm. so it's more yeah. on the level of organizationing or, or, or organizing and organizational quantifying if you wanted to go into the deeper quantifying you'd have to probably move it to SPSS which you can do you can export it from SPS to SPSS and do more of the statistical analysis um, but yeah it's definitely an interesting and you're gonna train help 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 us all get trained with yes. <laughs> teaching my that. teachers exactly <laughs> well but this is one of those things and I really appreciate Nancy your comment because I think I would fail us if I'd said that we should always um, expect our clients to teach us about social media, I mean about media because of the reasons you named and because we should be experts just as we should in anything else. But we should also have a place of curiosity right. always an open dialogue. Mm-hmm. And I think part of what makes us good therapists is acknowledging those places where we know and those places where we don't know and trying to educate ourselves always on the things that we know less, but also admitting them and, mm-hmm. and figuring out where we can meet, right? right. Yeah. So I think all of those. Thank you so much for your time. And as you know, digital technology is constantly evolving. I think this is, you know, a topic that we should always be striving to mm-hmm. be um, have some knowledge and skills and awareness of you know uh, of our own uh, competency, but really just keeping up as well. Um, so thank you so so much for your time. Thank, thank you, and thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.